It was Palm Sunday, but because of a sore throat, five-year-old Sammy couldn't go to church. So he had to stay home with his mom. And so his dad and all of his siblings went to church, and when they came back home, they all had these palm branches. And so Sammy asked, well, what, is, what are these palm branches for? And his dad explained that people waved them over Jesus' head as he walked by. And Sammy said, well, wouldn't you believe it? The one Sunday I don't go to church and Jesus shows up. <laughs> this morning we're, we're celebrating Palm Sunday and Jesus is welcomed into our sanctuary. We parade, we wave our palm branches, we welcome Jesus just as he was welcomed into Jerusalem when he was riding in on that donkey. We celebrate Jesus' triumphal entry into the holy city of Jerusalem where he comes to celebrate the Passover festival. And this morning, we celebrate how Jesus is with us in this moment, in this time, and we shout out, Hosanna in the highest. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. I invite you to stand as we hear God's word this morning. When Jesus and his followers approached Jerusalem, they came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives. Jesus gave two disciples a task, saying to them, Go into the village over there. As soon as you enter it, you will find tied up there a colt that no one has ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, Its master needs it, and he will send it back right away. They found, went and found a colt tied to a gate outside on the street, and they untied it. Some people standing around said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? They told them just what Jesus said, and they, left the, and they left them alone. They brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes upon it, and he sat on, sat on it. Many people spread out their clothes on the road, while others spread branches cut from the fields. Those in front of him and those following were shouting, Hosanna, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord, blessings on the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. After he looked around at everything, because it was already late in the evening, he returned to Bethany with the twelve. It's the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. You know, there's, there's nothing quite like a really good parade. I don't know what it is about a parade that we love so much. It's a, a celebration as a line of cars, floats, fire trucks, marching bands, horses, all that stuff. Uh, motorized vehicles processed down the street. The lights, I don't know, there's just something about um, parades that we love. People throw out candy and wave to you. Um, you see your favorite cartoon character float by. Um, and I'm still thinking about our uh, Christmas parade that we had, the float that was made, the best gingerbread church I think ever made in the history of the world. Um, but these parades help us celebrate um, festivities. They help us celebrate holidays like Christmas and New Year's and Fourth of July. I mean, what would Thanksgiving be without the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, right? How do we celebrate without a parade like that? We got the Rose Parade, the Mardi Gras Parade. We, we all love a good parade. And apparently so does Jesus, because this morning he orchestrates his own little parade, this impromptu parade, as he journeys into the holy city of Jerusalem for the Passover celebration. If any holiday ever deserves a parade, it's the Passover celebration. It is the biggest celebration for the Jewish people. It commemorates when God passed over um, those who had marked blood on the doorposts, when the Israelites were in Egypt and how God had led his people from slavery in Egypt out into the promised land through the desert. And so it's, it's a commemoration of what God has done for God's people. It's a celebration. It's a huge event. And, and the Jewish people celebrate this. But not only the Jewish people, um, travelers from all over the world would come to the holy city and celebrate this festival. Uh, that, Jewish historian Josephus indicated that during the Passover celebration, the population of Jerusalem increased to more than 2 million people. 
It's a huge celebration. And Jesus takes this opportunity to put on a little bit of a show. He has a little bit of a flair for the dramatic. He wants to get people's attention. And so as Jesus and his followers are approaching Jerusalem, he points to two of his disciples and he says, go ahead to the village nearby and get a colt. And if uh, anybody tells you, hey, what you're doing, just say the Lord needs it. Oh, and make sure that the colt's never been ridden on before. Uh, he, he does this very bizarre uh, request that doesn't seem to be 100% legal. I don't really know what's going on here. But these disciples go, they, they steal this donkey, this colt, they borrow it. And then the next thing we see in verse 4, um, these disciples come back and give the, the colt, the donkey, to Jesus. They do exactly what he had asked. They don't ask any questions. They don't seem confused. They just willingly and blindly obey him in this request that Jesus makes. And it's interesting because Jesus has made almost this whole journey on foot. He's walked this whole way on foot, and now that he's almost there, he wants to ride a donkey? It doesn't quite make sense. But Jesus is adamant. He makes this decision to ride on this young colt. And it's the only time throughout the Gospels that we see Jesus ride an animal. Every other time when Jesus is traveling, he's walking. Uh, he's never riding a donkey or a horse, a car, plane, train, nothing like that. Jesus is always walking. And yet, in this moment, he makes the decision to ride in on a donkey. Jesus makes this strange decision for a reason. He points us back to the prophet Zechariah, who said, Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you triumphant and victorious. Is he humble and riding on a donkey. Jesus' disciples probably are familiar with this scripture. And so maybe that's why they're not asking any questions. Perhaps that's why they, they just go and get this colt as Jesus' means of transportation. And it's also possible that the crowd there that day knew this passage of scripture as well, knew this prophecy, because they seemed to act, react to Jesus' entrance in a very special way. Jesus travels down the Mount of Olives, and on his arrival, the crowd cheers and applauds. So here Jesus comes, riding down on this humble colt, a donkey, marching through this triumphal parade. And in John's Gospel, the people have these palm branches that they're waving to welcome him in, to celebrate him and his arrival. Um, in Mark's Gospel, we see them, they take off their coats, their clothes, and they throw it on the floor, and they cut branches from the fields, and they wave them and put them on the, on the road. They celebrate this unusual king and this very unusual parade. And as he processes down the street, the crowd sings out shouts, praises to Jesus, Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The crowd shouts out, Hosanna. It's not really a, a word that we use often today, is it? You don't have that in your normal daily vocabulary. But it's a word that means, save us now. Save us now. The people, people offer this greeting to Jesus who's riding in on this humble donkey. They're crying out to Jesus like they would a savior, like they would a king, like they would a Messiah. It's a beautiful moment in the story of Jesus. It's a beautiful moment in the scriptures. And a part of me wishes we could just end the story right here and say, and Jesus lived happily ever after the end, right? But we know what comes next. We know that there's more to come in this story. We know that things take a dark turn. In just a few short days, that crowd that was shouting out, Hosanna, save us now, is will be shouting out, crucify him. But it's amazing because Jesus chooses to listen only to those shouts of Hosanna, save us now, and not the cries of crucify him. He chooses to respond with love. It's amazing that Jesus chooses to save a people who would end up betraying him, who would end up killing him. You know, friends, we are that crowd that shouts out, save us now, right? 
We claim Jesus as our Savior. We, we know that we need saving. We call out to Jesus, and we know that only He can save us. But we're also that crowd that shouts out, crucify Him. Because in our daily actions, we disobey Jesus' commands. We don't love our neighbors. We gossip. We ignore those in need. We fall short of being the people that God has called us to be. We betray Christ. But we serve a God who listens to us when we shout, Hosanna, save us now, and forgives us when we cry out, crucify Him. He forgives us when we betray Him. That's the God that we worship. A humble king that rode on a donkey and chose to save a people who spat in his face. As the United Methodist uh, Bishop Will Willimon says, the same crowd who yelled Hosanna when he marched into Jerusalem a few days before now yells crucify him. The voices arise from out of the congregation. They are our voices spoken in our language with our accent. It is a stunning moment of terrible realization. The voices which, which scream from the cruci- for the crucifixion and death of Jesus are our voices. But the good news is that our voices are not the last word on this week. Jesus did not flinch from the murderous mob. He did not sidestep the terror or miraculously escape into some divine world that was sealed from human pain or terror. He came among us. He passed through the waving palm branches and marched with us up to death, the place of the skull, Golgotha. He embraced the terror, all the terrible, horrifying, painful ambiguity of human existence. And from the cross said, brothers and sisters, I love you still. Over the next few days, Judas Iscariot will betray Jesus with a kiss in exchange for a few silver coins. Peter will deny Christ three times before the cock crows. The disciples will desert Jesus right after um, falling asleep in his time of need. And after all of this happens, Jesus will hang on a bloody cross and say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. The main theme of the passion story is not one of betrayal, but it's one of forgiveness. And I think that's a story that we desperately need in our lives. Because there are times when we have not loved God with our whole heart. Times when we have failed to be an obedient church. When we have not done God's will. When we have broken God's law. When we have rebelled against God's love when we have not loved our neighbors and when we have not heard the cries of the needy, when we have acted as the betrayer. But as we journey closer and closer to the cross, as we look upon Jesus, as we join in with that crowd that shouts out, crucify him, as we mock him and turn him away, Jesus replies, Father, forgive them. Today we celebrate a gentle king who came riding in on a donkey, who brings us salvation even when we don't deserve it, who chooses to free us from the bondage of sin and save us, who invites every single one of us into his holy kingdom. Because of Jesus, we should no longer respond in hate. Because of Jesus, we should no longer respond in violence. Because of Jesus, we should only respond in in love. Thanks be to God. Amen. This time I invite you to turn in your hymnals to page 30.